coughing a hundred times as hard as you possibly can isn't necessarily the best way to clear your mucus because what you're doing is you're collapsing down all your airways, you're causing bronchospasm. You know those people that you've probably all heard them that cough and 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 nothing actually comes up at the end of it. It's just an exhausting process. So they've had airway collapse, they've had bronchospasm and their airways have shut down, they've caused irritation, possibly burst a few blood vessels so they've maybe caused a little bit of bleeding, they might get a little bit of hemoptysis. It's quite a traumatic process and airway clearance is trying to be sort of a little bit more like, you know, yoga. We want nice, relaxed, open airways and we want lovely fluid movement of air in and out, not this really tight um, environment because we're not going to clear any air if we've created a really tight um, bronchospasm environment. Does that make sense? Yeah? So we still do um, postural drainage, um, modified postural drainage. We don't tip anybody anymore um, and we don't tip babies because babies are constantly refluxing whether they're upright or they've got those big bellies full of food and, and they're just constantly refluxing so we don't tip our babies. We don't tip our older children um, because older children with CF have been shown to have significant reflux as well. Adults with CF have reflux so we don't tip anybody because reflux and aspiration is, is, um, can contribute to bronchiectasis. So, um, and that's Pam's three kids are re reflux aspirators that all got bronchiectasis. Um, so, you know, they're evidence to the fact that we don't want to tip anybody anymore. Um, in our little bubs, we, um, we modify the air position so that they're all flat. So one of the most important things, I think, um, from a nursing point of view, um, is that you can, you can modify their positions, even if you're not doing any uh, hands-on techniques with them, modifying their position is enough to change the ventilation and perfusion in their lungs. Because if babies these days tend to be on, on their back, because that's safest for SIDS, um, but modifying their position to alter the airflow um, is really important. Babies have got little collapsible chest walls, They're, you know, so you lie them on their back and that part of their chest is not going to expand as, as much as if you were lying them on their tummy. Um, so you want to vary their position, obviously within the realms of safety, we're not going to put them on their tummy and walk away, um, but we, we want to modify their, their position and if you do nothing else then you know you can put them in sideline with a little pillow behind them or you know towards their front with a little uh, roll towel or something underneath them you are still going to be impacting their airway clearance because you're going to be altering their um, their ventilation and perfusion you're going to be getting air into different parts of their lungs so that's a really important thing to think about um, if you don't have access to anything else you can position uh, baby something that we use um, uh, quite a bit of these these days for, for physio and that has to do with the floppy airway so PEP is um, stands for positive expiratory pressure and what we're wanting to do with PEP is create a resistance to the breath out so if we can resist that breath out then that pressure that we're creating in the airways is going to pop into all those um, uh, closed bits that we were talking about before. So we want to create PEP. We also want to splint open all those airways that want to flop down. So those floppy, sloppy sort of airways that want to close down when we breathe out or when we cough. Uh, we want to create some positive pressure that keeps them open so that we can clear secretion. So PEP is really important. A lot of bubs are born with uh, floppy airways and it impacts them a lot because their airways are little. So when they're little and their airways are tiny and they flop down, there's not far between a tiny airway and a shut airway. Um, so as they grow, a lot of them, it doesn't impact them quite as much. Um, so we do use baby pep um, on um, some newborns. This is a slightly bigger mask, so you can use this on a newborn. But um, physios, the, all the physios will be sort of learning about uh, when and where we would apply baby pep and um, it basically is you know putting a mask on them and getting them to breathe against that resistance to just try and split those airways open and get nice relaxed airways um, so that's something that sort of uh, has been done um, in the last 10 years or so um, and it's becoming a little bit more frequent uh, physical activity sounds like a sort of silly thing in infants but um, Things that you can do with little ones to um, stimulate what would happen if they were physically active, you know, tickling them and you know, playing playing with them in a way that um, gets them to take big breaths if they're laughing, 
Um, you can sit on a bouncy ball and bounce up and down with them and that's changing their airflow. You know, they, as you bounce on the ball, they're and that's what we want. We want to change the airflow. So there are little things that you can do or you can encourage mums with bubs um, to do to try and um, facilitate that airway clearance. Um, in toddlers and preschoolers, we still use the modified postural drainage until they're old enough to take um, to be independent with their airway clearance. Um, we don't. We've got a lot of adults, and not so many now. But ten years ago, we had a lot of adults who were um, doing quite well with their um, with their CF, but relied on somebody else to do airway clearance for them. And when cystic fibrosis, particularly, was a disease of childhood, and kids um, died in their you know, before they reached the age of 10 or 20, it didn't really matter if you had mum and dad around and someone could do your airway clearance for you and that, that was okay. But if you want to grow up, have relationships, get married, have kids of your own, you don't want to be relying on somebody to do your airway clearance for you. So independence is um, our number one goal with people with cystic fibrosis. So as soon as they can, um, we move them on from postural drainage and percussion um, to doing things that are independent. So <coughs> blowing and huffing games. If you've got little toddlers in, in the hospital, you can encourage the families, or I, I know I say you guys can do it, but I know you don't have time because you've got a million other things to do and a million other patients, but <coughs> you can encourage um, mums um, and, and families to do blowing games, blow bubbles, um, blow tissues, you know, make little butterflies out of tissues and blow them off their hands, um, to, to do things that are um, active and involve taking big breaths, blowing, blowing out candles, you know, blowing, just anything that involves taking a big breath and blowing, because that's what we want them to learn how to do. And our kids who see it are the first ones to be able to blow out the candles on their birthday cake. They learn to blow properly, not just spit on the cake. So um, that's a really great skill that, that they learn right from the very beginning. Um, teaching them to cough to command, that's a really important thing as well. Um, and to be proud of their cough, to not, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, don't cough, put your hand over your mouth. Or we want, when our kids start coughing, we, we give them a big clap and say, fantastic, well done, great cough. So we encourage coughing because, as Pam was talking about earlier today, we want them to expect it. We want them to bring stuff up and we want that to be seen to be a good thing, not something to be embarrassed about. So changing the way we think about what, what we say to them. We cough into our elbow, not our hand, but we encourage them to cough into, into their elbow and we encourage them to cough. Um, huff and puff exercise, so running around, things that um, a lot of parents say, oh, they're really active, they're always on the go. And that's fantastic, but we want exercise that actually alters their breathing pattern. So if they're not huffing and puffing, then it's not effective exercise in terms of airway clearance. So we want huff and puff exercise, it's really important. Um, and the pet mask we still use, and then this is, I guess, one of the things that everybody has access to. Um, suction tubing stolen from a hospital um, close to here, uh, and a milk, milk bottle. So this is what we call bubble pep or bottle pep. Bubble pep or bottle pep is something that you guys can um, do with any patient who has um, secretions that they need to clear. Um, and basically, it's just providing the resistance to their breath out is provided by water. So if you've got a physio that maybe visits your area once every three months or you know something like that, if you can get them to help you get set up with a good bottle pet routine, um, then you guys can give that to the appropriate patients who've got um, mucus that, need, that needs clearing. So anyone with bronchiectasis or um, cystic fibrosis, is going to do well with bottle pet. So we fill the bottle up to about 10 centimetres. For littleies, we put um, food colouring and, um, and a little bit of detergent in there so that they can create a lovely volcano. It's pretty messy, which I know we love, and people in hospital make a lot of mess. And they just, they blow into the tube, uh, and the tube has to go all the way down to the bottom, so that column of water provides resistance, and they blow into that that creates positive pressure in their airways and helps them to clear their secretions. So that's something that is really effective for um, anyone with, with mucus. So, and, and it's cheap, easy. Um, we don't have access to suction tubing anymore. We have to buy it from Bunnings because we don't have anyone that can steal it for us anymore. But, um, you know, you guys just snip it off and off you go. Um, so that's a, a really good... Um, How do you keep the other man 
Oh, we um, so what you do is we've got it. I've got it threaded through the uh -huh. um, the handle of the bottle. So you just it's a yeah. tight squeeze, but you thread it through until it goes right down into the corner. And once it's down there, you just put it back a little bit so it doesn't just suck onto the corner. And then that's your that's your resistance. Fill it up with water, and away you go. Um, so that's great. There's a couple of different types of pep that you probably won't see out in the regions, but these are all different types of positive pressure devices. So if someone did come into your hospital that had been seen by a um, PMH, um, you would, you may see something like this. These are both um, what we call vibrating or oscillating PEP, and that just means that when you breathe out, there's a vibrating resistance, so you can feel that <coughs> resistance in your um, in your airway, and that just helps a little bit with creating a shearing force, trying to shape that mucus free. These two are, and, and the mask are non-oscillating um, PEP devices and they just provide resistance to the breath out um, with little plastic contraptions that, they're quite expensive, this is $100, this is 80 this is $238. Um, they're really, really expensive, this isn't. And, and it doesn't have to be so babyish. I think, I know that people use the water for irrigation bottles um, and they take the um, tube so that it, it's attached so it stays down the bottom. So there are lots of um, ways that you can apply that in a rural setting, which, you know, these, there is some funding to cover things like this for people with cystic fibrosis, but not for bronchiectasis, which, you know, is a shame. So um, they can access some funding, but it, you have to jump through a lot of hoops and they're probably not going to be jumping through those hoops, unfortunately. Uh, so primary school, it's, you know, same sort of stuff, and adolescents and adults. Um, I just thought I'd mention the vest. I don't know, are any of you familiar at all with the vest? Have you heard anything about the vest? No, we might skip over it. It's a, it came from the US, it's a device that, it's a vest, you strap it on, you put a tube on it and it shapes you about and stuff, and we don't use it really here in Australia, but the odd person does have one, so um, if you see that, then the best thing to do is to um, contact Charlie's or PMH because nobody else would probably be familiar with them at all. They look well though? No, the research has, there was a big study in Canada that compared the PET mask to the vest and um, they stopped the study because the outcomes for the PET mask were so much better than the vest, they didn't feel like they could continue with it. But now there's some discussion around whether or not it was they use the right um, settings on the vest and all that sort of thing. So, but no, we don't use it in Australia. We don't believe that the way it's currently used is effective, but the odd person does have one. Uh, exercise is really, really important throughout the life stage. And I you know we've talked before about how um, exercise is not necessarily, um, you can't replace physio with exercise, but if you're not getting either, then exercise is fantastic. The only thing I would say about if you're getting someone to, to exercise and that's all they're doing, um, then you can get them, if, we'll talk about huffing in a minute, but if they can huff and cough while they're exercising, then we'll call that airway clearance if that's all we've got. Because it's better to go, the gold standard would be that they do something else, but we've got to accept what we've got, and that might just be exercise. So we start at diagnosis, and we've talked about, um, you know, Kids, asymptomatic, happy, healthy looking kids with cystic fibrosis have got inflammation and infection in the lungs 80% of the time. So we start them at diagnosis, we create a routine. We want, this is lifelong, and we want them to be in a really good routine so that they can um, do it for their whole lives. Um, we individualise treatment. We try and teach lots of different airway clearance techniques because you know you can imagine if someone said to you, right, this is one thing, you have to do it every day like this, twice a day for the rest of your life, and, that, and it takes half an hour. Um, you think, oh, I don't know about that. So we try and give a little bit of variety so that they can get up and say, oh, today I think I'll do this, and you know this afternoon I might do that. And so we try and you know mix it up as much as we can, knowing that it is really not. Well um, so we've talked about um, people having um, well treatment from diagnosis. Uh, establishing a routine is the most important thing um, that we can do in our little people and people with bronchiectasis as well. If we can establish a good routine, then we're halfway there. And I know that that's really tricky if you get someone who comes in who's 10 and has never had to do anything 
and they're sort of, sort of already halfway down the path. They've got more hips. This is established. It's, it, it is irreversible. You know, they've had a few years. Um, trying to get them to then start a routine is really, really difficult and, and um, a, a big challenge and we appreciate that. And that's why as soon as we hint at, of a diagnosis of bronchiectasis and as soon as someone's diagnosed with CF, we get in there right from the beginning. So they know no different. Uh, the MSCF program, I think Jan spoke about and um, a few other people have spoken about that one, so we want to talk about that. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to talk about was inhalation therapy. So there's lots of different things that um, that we are being trialled at the moment that are very different from um, what was done, you know, 10 years ago. Um, just recently, we've had um, an inhaled mucus thinner called bronchitol. And bronchitol, um, in the past, our mucus thinners needed a nebulizer, so they needed to sit down, plug in, off you go, do your nebulizer. So bronchitol um, is um, a, something that they can take on the go. So it's capsules, you pierce the capsule and you... Um, so that's a big advance because people can... You can have your bronchitol on the way to school in the car or you can have it, you know, it, it just makes it so much more portable. It, um, the neb takes 15, 20 minutes, so bronchitol can be done in about seven minutes and you don't need to plug it in anywhere or do anything with that. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, Tobramycin, now there's a uh, Tobramycin that can be given via a pod haler, which is the same, you know, it's a little capsule piercing thing. So, um, so things are becoming more portable and, and treatments are advancing, but um, we need to have compliance and adherence to treatments for them to be effective. So um, I just wanted to show you a few different NEBs. Um, are you guys familiar with this sort of a NEB? It's an air compressor NEB? No? Okay, so this NEB, these are mostly what people will have. I'm just going to plug it in so you can hear how noisy it is. Um, so this is our, um, the, the standard sort of NEB. The air comes out here, we plug it into the bottom, the liquid gets put in, makes a lot of noise and makes a lot of smoke and, and carry on. Um, our little bubs who are on the RSCF program are having nebulizers really, really young these days. And if you can imagine trying to put a big, a big smoky mask with all of that noise on the face of a, of a baby and hold it there for, you know, 20, 25 minutes, very, very tricky. So there's a couple of new NEBs that have um, come onto the market recently, the Aero NEB um, and the e -Flow. And these might not be things that you have ever seen, but you might start seeing them um, floating around the place. So these both work in a completely different way. So this neb is on now, you can't hear it, um, but there's a little bit of smoke coming out there, it's quite cool. Um, it's quick, it works in a completely different way. So it nebulizes the liquid in there in a completely different way and um, it's quite much easier to get that onto the face of a baby than um, the big loud air compressor one. So that one um, and the e flower are both similarly. I don't know if this e flower will work. I think it's been run over by a truck. Um, yep, so that's the same. So both, you know, very quiet, um, much easier to administer and, um, than the other nebulizer. And, uh, but very, very um, big price tag, particularly for the eFlow um, 1375, is very, very expensive. So not really accessible to many people. Do parents own these? Uh, so the, the parents will own, if they've got cystic fibrosis, um, we will give them an air compressor NEB because everybody needs a backup NEB, everyone needs to have one and that's the cheapest, most reliable um, option. Um, but we have, over the last few years, through a series of grants, gotten some e-flows and air NEBs, so we must have about 40 of them now and we loan the unit out to people and we give them their own consumables. And then, um, so we've been able to loan them to, you know, sort of 100 people and we can keep loaning them out to people so that they can use them when they need them. And we're happy to post them to the regions, you know, we'll, once someone knows how to use it and they've used it once, we'll post it out to them and they can just go for it. Um, so there are better options out there than there used to be, so that's just something to consider. Um, and I know I'm, I need to be done, so I will be very, very fast. Can I just ask you a yes. question? Yes. What's that? Um, and you're, I mean, nebulizers where you get their little angles. Yeah. Is that the same, or is it different? No, it's the same. You just squirt it in, and off it goes. And uh, some of them turn off when they're finished, and some of them just have normal smoke coming out of them. So uh, they're really good. 
Um, so just looking at an order of order of treatment for airway problems. <coughs> so if you've got someone who comes in with um, uh, who's got bronchiectasis or cystic fibrosis and they're taking um, they're taking a mucus thinner like bronchitol or a hypertonic saline, the salty neb, uh, they must have an um, uh, Ventolin first, and Pam did talk about that, so that's a really important um, thing to, to remember. It doesn't matter what order they do their airway clearance and their exercise, as far as you can put airway clearance or exercise in there, one before the other, it doesn't matter. It works differently for different people. Some people do better one way, some people do better the other. Antibiotics, nebulised antibiotics always come last in that process. We don't want them coughing out their antibiotic with their airway clearance or their exercise. Um, we want all that antibiotic to stay in the airway and work on the mucus that's in there. So antibiotics always last. Uh, exercise we've talked about needs to be um, needs to be really good aerobic strength, puff and puff exercise. Um, infection control. I mean, you guys, you can read through all this sort of stuff. The equipment needs to be cleaned up. Use even this. We have to. Sometimes we go into people's homes and we see a. Um, <coughs> bubble cap that's probably been sitting there for like the last two months, it's got black in the tube and it's foul. Um, it needs to be cleaned after, every time they use it we tip it out, we start again, we need to educate them on cleaning. Uh, we always let everything air dry, so we air drying is the way to go and we don't pack it away, we use it again while it's still wet. Uh, incontinence we've talked about, oh, This is the, I'll finish on this, so um, there was a um, a questionnaire that went out to adolescents with cystic fibrosis and um, they wanted to find out what's the worst thing about about um, having CF and um, as you can see the number one first worst thing about having CF was physio they actually didn't really mind so much being unwell having to take medications or even having CF taking enzymes they hate physio so we know that and we have to evolve to to you know change with that because you can't just keep forcing the same thing onto someone who's not interested and who is um, you know not doing it because if they're not interested they're not they're not going to do it and then we're all getting nowhere so I guess all these things that have come up have come up you know by the process of evolution and that you know you've got to, you've got to move with the times and come up with something more interesting um, because that's our biggest challenge. Um, they don't like physios and they don't like physios, so we, um, we know that. Um, I've got a, quite a bit of stuff on adherence in there um, and you guys can have a read through that. Um, adolescent CF patients reported strong doubts about the necessity of chest physio and I think because you don't feel better when you've done it, you don't do it and go, oh that's great, I feel really good now. They often do it and it makes them cough, or it could make them feel worse. And they don't see that long term, you know, they're losing a little bit of lung function. They don't see that, they just see that, um, oh, that was a waste of time. And, you know, like, that's a very adolescent attitude. So, um, yeah, we need, to, we need to know that that's happening and try and figure out why. Um, find the barriers. Um, so our program here, we have 11 home care workers. So we have 11 metropolitan and one Bunbury um, carer who see our people uh, with cystic fibrosis. We've got someone in Mandra, someone in Bunbury, a couple in Rockingham and the others in Metro. We go up to Yanship. Um, and they provide ongoing support with airway clearance and exercise. And that is a fantastic service that's accessible to people with CF. In the past, um, HAP have provided a similar um, service in rural areas, but not, not anymore. We're, uh, we're not a disability or we don't come under the right criteria, so we don't do that anymore. Um, so yeah, it's it's hard out there, and particularly with people with bronchiectasis, there aren't any great um, programs like ours set up in, um, to service those people. Um, contact details for Pam, Jamie, who's from Charlie's, and myself, always very, very happy to be contacted if you've got anyone that you want um, advice on or you want to know where to send them or what to do. Um, we've got a good network of contacts now. Having run this program for five years, we do know physios in various regions who, who don't necessarily um, stay in their area, might be able to pop out and help you with things if you need them. But always ring us, we can, um, we're happy to help in any way. That we